Nadi Gurdjian. Hello, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose ancestral lands we gather this evening. And I want to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. When I think about reconciliation, I find myself asking the question, what is it? And another question, what do we mean by it? There is, of course, an ordinary, everyday meaning of the word which invokes interpersonal relationships. But it is also about accommodating different ideas and beliefs. Webster's free, yes it's free, online dictionary says the meaning of reconciliation is a situation in which two people or groups of people become friendly again after they have argued. Or reconciliation is the process of making two opposite beliefs, ideas, or situations agree. Now I think that in the sense of reconciliation at a national level here in Australia, we're looking and meaning the latter outcome. And to a much lesser degree, the former. But I see reconciliation very much as a process that perhaps continues through generations. Because beliefs, ideas and situations change, not just intergenerationally, but also within a single generation. What is acceptable to us now may not be what our children, our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren embrace as acceptable. Reconciliation, of course, must involve and include social change over generations. And it also must include what we call social justice. I see social justice in pretty simple terms. Social justice, to me, is of course what hits you when you get up in the morning. Do you wake up in a place that is secure and safe? Does it keep you and your family comfortably? Is there food in the house? Can you provide breakfast for your kids? And do they have food to take to school? Does that school honour and value who they are? 
despite their socio-economic circumstances, ethnicity or cultural background? Are you able to adequately provide for them? Is your workplace free of discrimination? Is your work rewarding? Are you and your family embraced by the society in which you live? Embraced as equals? Enjoying the rights and fundamental freedoms assumed by all? Does that society care for the poor, the sick, the disabled, the elderly, and its minorities? Does the laws of those, that society apply equally and fairly to all its citizens, including you? Do you feel you have a say in the social and economic development of your country? Do you feel you can effectively engage politically in your country? Does your country care for the environment. This to me is what social justice is about and this is what it is at the heart of reconciliation. Now when I look through the Aboriginal lens I too often see something other than reconciliation and social justice. I see inequality, discrimination, unfairness and isolation. I see marginalisation, dispossession and ostracism. I see denial, ignorance and enmity and I feel despair. Despair because I feel powerless to do anything about it. Oh yes, I've spoken out. I've been political, politically active. I've been a bit of a troublemaker. I've made some noise. I raise my voice when I can and say to others, black and white. And occasionally we're listened to. But I fear we are rarely heard. Now you might say these are the not the sentiments of a person heading to a reconciliation. So why am I and we struggling so? It's now 25 years since we embarked on this journey. So what then have we achieved if I still feel this way? Or perhaps more importantly, where have we gone wrong? Part of the answer, I think, is in the fact that we have not put enough energy into dealing with the unfinished business. We are still a people of two opposite beliefs a people of two opposite ideas, a people of two opposite situations. 
any move to accept different beliefs, to share and understand situations of others, is too often met without grace, compromise or understanding. We seem content to persist with the status quo and the elephants in the room are blissfully ignored. Status quo gives us more of the same. Intervention without free prior informed consent. Community closures without notice and denial of recognition. And the tired, worn out, off repeated, failed public policy. Now, please don't allow me to leave you with the impression that over the past two decades plus five, the relationship between black and white Australia has not improved. It certainly has, but we still have a way to go. And I can say that we've managed to raise awareness and lift the level of cultural competency amongst non-Indigenous Australians which makes us a better place than we were back then. What gnaws at me is that there is no movement on fundamental issues. Issues that simply will not go away while we're busying ourselves with other things and it's the unfinished business. So what is the unfinished business? Or what of, or who are the elephants in the room? Well, I see it as follows. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders were in relative peaceful occupation and possession of the land mass and islands we now call Australia for between 50 and 60,000 years before 1788. In 1788, the British came and purported to take the place, take possession of the place on behalf of the British monarchy without the consent of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The taking of the land and its resources which has now proceeded for over 200 years, was and is unjust. It's unlawful and it's had a devastating impact on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples for over two centuries. What the British did and what has continued under colonial and post-colonial governments was wrong. And these wrongs and what has flowed from them have never been adequately addressed or redressed. We were in two opposite situations back then as we are now. However, the situation of the British and those who followed them has got stronger. And the situation of indigenous peoples of this land has got weaker. Of that, there can be no doubt.
our institutions of democracy and power continue to fail us in freeing us from our past. Those institutions both arise from and are underpinned by the brutal dispossession of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples from our lands because they are integral, an integral part of the Western judicial and liberal tradition. We fail today to imagine like the colonial imagination failed to, an, to, an imagine, to imagine a relationship of equality and coexistence in all its variations. And that is the fundamental source of our problem today. And it's perhaps this failure of imagination that we ought to be addressing in the reconciliation process. The unsettled issues of past dispossession and our inability to deal with old problems in a new world demands we do things differently. And the one indisputable thread running through the many tragedies in our shared history is that we fail to learn from our past. Or maybe we just don't want to learn from our past. As Fitzmaurice obliquely observes, the justice of dispossession of Indigenous peoples from their lands has become one of the most important political questions of the post-colonial world and that reconciliation cannot be pursued without asking the key historical question of whether and how colonisation was justified. If we crave reconciliation, we need to collectively come up with an answer to that question. Kalia, thank you, I'm done. <laughs>